Number 10. Cursed trumpets. King Tut's trumpets are a pair that were found in the burial chamber of the 18th dynasty pharaoh upon discovery. One silver and one bronze. The oldest operational trumpets in the world and the only known surviving examples from ancient Egypt. Both are engraved with images of the gods and both were silent for more than 3,000 years before the trumpets were played for 150 million people live on a BBC broadcast in 1939. And then World War II happened. Yeah, because apparently the curator of the Tut collection at the Egypt Museum says whenever they're played, a war occurs. Yeah. The bronze trumpet was stolen from the museum in Cairo during the looting riots of 2011, and then hilariously enough, returned two weeks later. Yeah, apparently Buddy didn't like the ancient gods just roaming his condo. Uh, you think? Number nine. Annabelle, the most infamous and dangerous possessed doll in the world. Yeah, pretty well all you need to know about that. Found at the home of the Warren's Occult Museum in Connecticut, we know a little bit about this doll with all the films about her. She rests inside a glass case marked warning, positively do not touch. Aggressive, but necessary. Gifted to a nursing student from a thrift store in the 70s, incidents involving levitating onto the table and running around at night, she took the doll to a medium who said it was possessed by a little girl who had passed. Ed and Lorraine were called shortly after and they offered to take it to their home. On the way home, Ed said that the doll was making the car do funny things. Swerving, no power steering, brake checks, haunted, haunted, yeah. The museum unfortunately shut down in 2019, but the cursed objects seem to be staying put, which the owners even refuse to make eye contact with. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, I would definitely Ronaldo that thing across the room if it was running around my apartment 2 a.m. Just field goal it right out the window. Number eight, Travis Walton. The horrifying abduction of Arizona forester Travis Walton. This is my favorite alien abduction case, yet the scariest, hands down. Fire in the Sky, filmed in 1993, does a pretty bang up job at what happened that night. In 1975, Walton and a logging crew were working in the National Forest. Him and six of his coworkers encountered a saucer-shaped craft feet away from their truck, making a high-pitched tone. The curious Walton was then blasted by a light beam and apparently abducted into their ship. The men were terrified and drove off immediately. Walton claims that he then woke up in a hospital room on board, observed by three short bald creatures, before fighting tirelessly and losing consciousness. He remembers nothing else until he found himself awake, walking along a highway five days later, naked, just wandering the highway in a daze. He's had tons of interviews, Guy was definitely taken. He's also so peaceful about it too. He's just convinced that they tried to heal him from the accidental blast. I check your organs in your pineal gland. Just make sure they're all there and intact, you know? Holy moly. Number seven, werewolves of London. Real werewolves. In the 80s, Lorraine and Ed Warren traveled in search of a real life wolf man. Apparently they were watching a TV show following the life of a local werewolf, Bill Ramsey in London, England, and Lorraine felt a strange connection to him. After a quick trip to London for more answers, she found Bill's whereabouts. Unlike usual werewolf folklore, he didn't transform every full moon and he didn't get bit. Bill Ramsey was apparently possessed by an evil wolf spirit. That's right. It was so bad that he needed a full-blown exorcism. The Warrens brought Bill back to Connecticut to meet Bishop Robert McKenna, and the exorcism was a success. Thanks to everyone involved that day, Bill lives a pretty normal life now, very unpossessed. Yeah, I'd hope so. This is terrifying. Imagine that's your neighbor. Yeah, sometimes I change into a werewolf once in a blue moon. I'm Bill, nice to meet you, welcome to the neighborhood. This is a fruitcake. Number six. Osiris. Yet again, something stolen that's very, very old. Why do people steal the oldest, most cursed stuff? The infamous statue of Osiris. In 1971, during an excavation in Saqqara, Egyptologist Walter Brian Emery found a small statue of the Egyptian god of death, Osiris. Emery took the statue of Osiris and once at his house, Emery went to the bathroom to shower. After a few moments, apparently his assistant heard Emery screaming in fear. He found him, clutching the sink, scared to death and paralyzed. Emery was diagnosed with paralysis of the right side of his body and was unable to speak. He died the following day. Uh, yeah, talk about a curse of the pharaohs. Like, buddy, you can't just steal stuff and then just throw it up overseas in a museum. Especially the stuff that clearly says in hieroglyphics, do not remove, this is cursed. It's pretty clear right there. Like, never steal anything ancient, you know? That's just a scary movie like waiting to happen. Number five. The Perrin family. In 1952, Ed and Lorraine founded the New England Society for Psychic Research. They quickly gained notoriety after this next case. 
the Perrins. In 1971, the Perrin family, Carolyn, Roger, and their five daughters moved into a 14-room farmhouse in Rhode Island. At first, items started disappearing, then the ghostly sightings started. It was discovered that the home had some previous sinister owners, self-emulation, freak accidents, and of course, murder in the attic. Whoever the spirit was, she perceived herself to be the mistress of the house, and she resented the competition my mother posed. The parents asked the Warrens to come in more than 10 separate times to help against this sinister, ghastly entity. During one seance, Carolyn was possessed, even rising from the ground while sitting in a chair. Andrea, the oldest daughter, said, My mother began to speak a language not of this world in a voice not of her own. Then her chair levitated and she was thrown across the room. Yeah, just zipping around the house, floating around on a chair like the Jetsons? Yeah, no thank you, that's like haunted haunted. Just bulldoze that thing, would ya? Number four, the ring. One ring to rule them all. The vine ring, AKA the ring of Silvianus, is a gold ring from the fourth century AD. The ring was discovered on a farm in 1785 in England. First, the property of a British Roman named Silvianus. Apparently, it was stolen by a person named Senecianus, upon which Silvianus hexed the ring with a curse. In 1929, during excavations of the site, archaeologists discovered the now curse that goes with said ring, consulting shortly after with one J.R.R. Tolkien. Mm. The band of the ring has 10 edges. Among it is the goddess Venus engraved, along with the words, live in God. The lore goes, Silvianus' ring was stolen by someone named Senecianus. Silvianus created and hexed a tablet, which he wrote, for the god Nodens. Silvianus has lost a ring that has donated one half of its worth to Nodens. Among those named Senecianus, permit no good health until it's returned to the temple of Nodens. Yeah, that sounds like a spell to me, dude. And Noden is like Poseidon, so you don't want any of that smoke. Number three, a haunting in Connecticut. Based on all real case and point, a 2009 gem, the accounts of the horrific case of the Snedekers who moved into a ghost infested house in Connecticut, unknowingly moving into one of the most sinister haunted funeral homes on earth. At first, mom notices items missing, but that's just the start. Then the children started to see strange people in their home, and then their son started to act a little strange. Violent outbursts, physical attacks on his own family, Maybe he was becoming the next victim to the house's grim history. After months of scary stuff going on, the Warrens were finally called in and turned out the morticians that had lived there previously had practiced some abysmally sinister acts on some lifeless bodies, deepening the home into the hell it was now sold as. An exorcism or two later, and the house finally became a home again. The case can be reimagined in 2009's Haunting in Connecticut, where the story follows the story drawn out by the Snedekers all those sinister years ago. Yo, Taylor gets possessed, I'm swinging immediately. You know what I mean? Like so many holy hands right away, just. Number two, Statue of Lem. The Women of Lem statue was discovered in Lem, Cyprus in 1878 and dates back to about 3500 BCE. The statue earned the nickname the Goddess of Death after four different families experienced tragedy while possessing the carved stones. The first owner, along with his entire family, died within six years of owning the statue, all of mysterious and rapid illnesses. The other two owners also died, of course, along with their entire families, just a few short years after obtaining the statue. The fourth owner died alongside his wife and two daughters of mysterious causes while in possession of the rock. Now, a gift to the Royal Scottish Museum in Edinburgh, it's encased in glass, safe, and unable to bear any other family bad omens. And number one, the mummy. My number one spot, of course, this is the most terrifying find of all. In 1991, a 5,000 year old frozen preserved human mummy was discovered in the frozen Otzel Apse of Italy. Otzi, of course, is the name the researchers chose to name this mummy for obvious location reasons. Otzi, though, is believed to have been murdered before being frozen in time due to the discovery of an arrowhead embedded in his left shoulder, various wounds on his body, and also the blood soaked tunic he's wearing with multiple people's DNA on it. Maybe in combat, maybe from megafauna. Who knows? Scientists believe that he's the oldest known naturally preserved mummy on Earth. This is where it's gonna get spooky. Once unearthed, a curse surfaced too, and grew stronger as people linked to him began to die one after another in violent freak accidents. So far, seven deaths have been tied or related to Otzi's de-thawing, including forensic pathologist who was killed in a car accident en route to give a speech about Otzi. 
a mountaineer in an avalanche, a hiker who discovered the Iceman falling down a treacherous path, the molecular archaeologist was found dead in his home, the head of the forensic team had a heart attack, another discoverer died of a sudden brain tumor, and another of multiple sclerosis. Yo, say what you will about curses, when people start dropping all involved with the find, I'd say it's probably the 5,000 year old mummy you just found. You think? Number 10. John Mack. In the early 90s, a Pulitzer Prize winning psychologist named Dr. John E. Mack made the jump from diagnosing ordinary psychological conditions to researching apparent alien abductees and their stories and experiences surrounding UFOs. Yep, Google it up. It's actually terrifying and very real. Apparently cases studied by Mack and abductions sometimes get involved with hypnosis. This guy was a tenured professor since the 50s at Harvard. He did his research. The UFO abduction rabbit hole led him to interviewing and studying more than 200 people who insist that they were taken. At first he was trying to crack the psychosis of the subject, but after studying and funding from the Rockefellers, private donors, and universities, he wrote numerous books on the phenomena and its strangeness. Again, tenured and Pulitzer Prize winner. He sadly passed in 2004 from a drunk driver. His life and death holds heavy conspiracy debate around it. Check it out, it's uh, a little bit strange. Number nine, Sophia. We've seen her on Fallon, we've seen her on breakfast television. She still looks like a bad cyberpunk character, doesn't she? Sophia by Hanson Robotics, the most advanced human-like robot that we have. Well, actually this is like their 12th one. This is the world's first robot citizen. Literally. Not only is she considered a citizen, she has a credit card and a seat in the UN. Like what? In 2016, Sophia premiered on the Jimmy Fallon show playing rock, paper, scissors. Yeah, simple stuff. Two years later, she's harmonizing with Jimmy live. Also, they didn't sing Mr. Roboto. Like, I just feel like that was a huge missed opportunity there. Like, where are the writers, dude? I've seen the Terminator and Ex Machina, and at the Web Summit presentation in 2018, Sophia and her brother Han glitched out on stage and had a terrifying, cryptic, non-coherent conversation, joking about ending the world. Yeah, it's horrifying, you gotta check it out. Dude, I feel like Furbies were their first try, and now they got these like brat dolls mini Sophias coming out soon. Like, where's this going? Number eight, Arthur Flowerdew. James Arthur Flowerdew was born in England in 1906. Grew up, paid his taxes, lived a pretty normal life. At about the age of 12, he began to have strange recurring dreams and hallucinations though. Over time, crystallizing into a very clear and vivid image. Dreams riddled with stone cities, carvings in cliffs, and vast deserts. He didn't understand what it all meant. One day, as an old man, he was watching a documentary on the BBC on the ancient city of Petra in Jordan. He was stunned. This was the city he had always seen. He called the BBC and asked them to interview him. Archaeological experts and the Jordanian government even invited him to come out to Jordan, where he continued to even baffle experts. Flowerdew was able to find his way around the city without a map, giving precise details on landmarks and even pointing out undiscovered locations. Yeah, here's the scary part. After all of this, he was convinced that he had lived an entire previous life in ancient times and was reincarnated in the 20th century. Number seven, Proctor's Ledge. Over 1,000 documents from Salem's witch trials, yet none of the accounts actually specify where the hangings took place. For more than 300 years, it was believed that the 19 people who were accused, tried, and executed in the Salem Witch Trials of 1692 were hanged at the summit of Gallows Hill. Maps of 1700 Salem show Gallows Hill marked out, but no actual marker of the execution site. Hmm, that's odd. A team of researchers began to reconsider the evidence in 2010 and eventually concluded it was the right spot. Yeah, oopsies. Actually, the real execution spot was called Proctor's Ledge. Also, eerie name for where they hang people, isn't it? It was confirmed in 2016 by scientists after ground penetrating data and writings from 1692 that it wasn't the actual location of the brutality. I know what you're thinking. It's named after John Proctor. No, no it's not. However, really odd timing as he was one of the witches accused of witchcraft. Locals say that the ghost named the Lady in White visits Proctor's Ledge often, which now makes sense with the whole we found the right spot stuff. Visitors claim to have caught sightings of her and even catch her disembodied voice. Yeah. Number six, props. Elmer McCurdy was an American outlaw, running with a small crew, banking and train robbing the Wild West until he was killed in a shootout with sheriffs after robbing a Katy train in Oklahoma in 1911. Famously known as the bandit who wouldn't give up, 
His mummified body was first put on display at an Oklahoma funeral home before being an amusement, traveling carnival show to carnival show during the 1920s right through the 1960s. After changing ownership several times, McCurdy's remains eventually wound up at the Pike Amusement Zone in Long Beach, California. His corpse was then used as a prop, but then discovered by a film crew on a set of The Six Million Dollar Man. They were positively identified in 1976 and the following year in 1977, Elmer McCurdy's body was finally laid to rest at the Summit View Cemetery in Oklahoma. McCurdy's fingers were apparently so damaged that detectives couldn't even pull a fingerprint. The coroners had to x-ray his teeth and measure his bones to ID him. His pockets included a bullet, a Sunny Amusement Museum of Crime ticket, a newspaper article, and a 1924 penny. Yeah, that's terrible. Just weekend at burning him for like 60 years set to set? Not really knowing it's a real body? People will do anything for money, won't they? Number five. Operation High Jump. Operation High Jump, officially named the United States Navy Antarctic Developments Program, launched in 1946 to 1947, an operation to establish an Antarctic research base organized by Admiral Richard E. Byrd. High Jump included 4,700 men, 13 ships, and 33 aircrafts. The war's end signaled the onset of the atomic age and a desire to secure supplies of uranium. With its almost unlimited mineral deposits, the largely unexplored territory of Antarctica was just the prize. It commenced 1946 and ended in late 1947. Or did it? Also known as Task Force 68, Byrd and his team established the Little America 4 base near three previous bases in the ice. The frozen aircrafts would photograph as much of the Antarctic's land surface as possible during this three month operation. Seems like the public thinks that high jump could have been more fishy than we think. Seems like skeptics are leaning towards more of a secret military expedition to the center of the earth type stuff. Yep, apparently there's a mouth to the center of the planet in the Antarctic and there was a secret race to find it. High Jump is still today at the mercy of the internet on whether or not it was a legit project or a secretly funded scientific expedition. Google it up, it's pretty wild and very real. Number four, Ouija boards. Popularized by teens in the 1970s, the Ouija board has earned its reputation over the years. Created almost 100 years before its heightened popularity, the year is 1891. And as the first ads started to appear in papers claiming, quote, Ouija, the wonderful talking board. The title from a Pittsburgh toy and novelty shop. The first paper described it as a magical game that answered questions about the past, present, and future with marvelous accuracy. A flat board with the letters of the alphabet configured in two semicircles. Above, the numbers zero through nine. The words yes and no in the upper corners, goodbye at the bottom. No batteries included, nor needed. Now. The origins are pretty messy, and it's hard to kind of pinpoint who or what inspired these early attempts at this game. It kind of just appeared on shelves. No, literally. The Kennard Novelty Company exclusively made and marketed these talking boards, and apparently the lore goes that one of the designer's sisters was a medium and asked the board what it would like to be called. It responded, Ouija, followed by good luck. Well, that's absolutely terrifying. At least good sportsmanship though, right? Yeah, I've never played with one of these, nor will I ever. That's a no-brainer for me, 100%. Number three, the Philadelphia Experiment. I pray that this one is a hoax because there's a lot of documents that relate to this subject around the time that don't really seem to add up. The Philadelphia Experiment was an alleged event witnessed by Carl Allen and the United States Navy Shipyard in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in October 1943. Allen describes an experiment where the U.S. Navy attempted to render itself invisible, cloaking the destroyer, the USS Eldridge, and the bizarre scientific results that followed. On Allen's account, the destroyer successfully made itself invisible, but the ship inexplicably teleported to Norfolk, Virginia for several minutes and then reappeared back in Philly. Sounds pretty cool, right? So what's the catch? The ship's crew was supposed to have suffered various side effects, including insanity, intangibility, and being frozen in place. Like people stuck in the walls and stuff. Stuck in the floors like this is a scene from Jumanji. Terrifying. The story surfaced in the late 1950s when Allen sent a book full of handwritten letters referring to the experiment to a U.S. Navy research organization. The U.S. Navy maintains that there has been no such experiment ever conducted and that the details are highly exaggerated and falsified. Dude, I hope so, because this is horrifying. Number two, wow. 
In a 1959 paper, Cornell University physicists speculated that if an extraterrestrial civilization was attempting to communicate with us using radio signals, that they might use a frequency of 1420 megahertz, which is naturally emitted by hydrogen the most common element in the universe. In 1973, Ohio State University assigned the Big Ear to the scientific search for extraterrestrial intelligence. 1977, Jerry Amon, a SETI volunteer astronomer, was analyzing data and spots a series of signal intensities and frequencies that left him and his colleagues astonished. The WOW signal was the first signal detected from Earth. The signal came from the direction of the constellation Sagittarius. Amon discovered the anomaly. Impressed by the result, on the computer printout he circled 6EQUJ5 and wrote three letters beside it. WOW. Leading to the event's famous name. The signal lasted for a full 72 seconds and it remains today as the strongest candidate for an ET radio transmission ever detected. And number one, of course, the USS Cyclops. Launched in May of 1910, the USS Cyclops was a Protus class collier built for the United States Navy, a huge cargo ship designed for transporting coal. In 1918, the cursed vessel left Rio de Janeiro, heading for Barbados, right around a certain dangerous triangle. Unfortunately, the Voyager was never to be seen again. Named Cyclops after a race of giants from Greek mythology, she was huge and heavy, unmissable by the naked eye. So what happened to her? The loss of the ship and crew still remains the single largest loss of life at sea the United States Navy has ever experienced. Funny thing is, it went right through the Bermuda Triangle, a place where magnetic compasses stop working, ships are never heard from again, and of course the military still refuses to operate and research. Skeptics are quick to say aliens and black holes, but the magnetism surrounding the Bermuda Triangle cases might be a logical explanation. I think they still owe us some explanations, no? I'm looking at you, Freedom of Information Act. Number 10, Animal Heaven. This was pretty odd, and we're still talking about it, rightfully so. Coco the Gorilla, she was a famous primate known for her ability to communicate through sign language. We've all seen that video with her and Robin Williams tickling each other laughing. It's heartbreaking, it's beautiful. Gorillas are very smart and very strong, so strong. Francine Patterson, who was Coco's trainer and of course the closest human around to Coco, was asked in an interview how deep their conversations with Coco would actually go. The caregiver showed Coco a skeleton once and asked if it is alive or dead. Coco signed, dead, draped. Draped means covered up. Then they asked, where do animals go when they die? And then Coco said, apparently Coco said, a comfortable hole. And then she gave a kiss goodbye. Yeah, philosophical debates followed, of course, because what was she referring to here? Was Coco being referred to being put into the ground, literally? Or was she talking about an afterlife? A comfortable hole in the afterlife world? I don't know. Girls are so smart, and again, so strong. Number nine, Derek Amato. What started with tragedy ended in symphony. Here we go, I had no idea this was possible, and now I'm questioning everything. Derek Amato is a self-taught pianist who gained worldwide attention after a traumatic brain injury caused him to develop acquired Savin syndrome. Derek was diving into a shallow pool back in 2006. Now his concussion actually made him lose some of his hair and some of his memory, it was bad. But in a bizarre turn of events after the accident, Derek became musical genius. Guy was killer on the keys, who knew? This condition allowed him to access exceptional music abilities that were for sure not around before the accident. Amato actually released his own album titled Life in the Keys. That's incredible, I've tried so many times. Number eight, Katolan. A Mongol princess and descendant of Genghis Khan. Let's talk about her. Katolan is known in history for her undefeated wrestling abilities. If you can say that. She was said to have issued a challenge to any man who wanted to marry her, stating that the first must defeat her in a wrestling match. Now, despite many attempts by many, many men, Katolan reportedly remained undefeated, with some accounts suggesting she won as many as 10,000 matches. Yeah, tender, but make it exhausting, sure. Instead of a super swipe, she's giving your legs swiped. I don't know. A super choke? Her story has become a legendary tale of strength and independence in Mongolian history. And also, how terrifying is that woman? Imagine being like number 6,000. You're like, I don't think I'm gonna do it. I don't think I'm gonna tap her out. I really have no clue. Uh, number seven, Hector. I'm not referring to the Greek hero Hector. No, not this time, not, not this time, Bumblebee. No, I'm referring to the cloud that was named after him. Yeah, we're talking about clouds now because eh, why not? Hector is a famous cloud formation that appears in the Tiwi Islands of Australia. Now the cloud appears from September to March every single year, every single day, which is 
Terrifying. What's going on here? The area's unique weather patterns are quite the spectacle. The name Hector's Thunderstorm, or simply Hector, which I'm more fond of, that name also comes from a powerful storm that struck the area back in 1930s. A World War II pilot named it Hector, and that's how memorable it was. It's still going strong today. Yeah, today, even right now, I guess, yeah, Hector is still going. Tomorrow, Hector's gonna disappear. It's the last day to catch Hector. It's right now. Go get your last minute views on Hector. That's crazy, I didn't realize that was today. At this point, he's a popular tourist attraction. Visitors can go and take boat tours to witness the spectacular lightning displays surrounding the storm. Me, personally, I want nothing to do with that. I watched Nope recently, so, no, this one freaked me out. I don't like clouds that show up on the regular. I don't know. Clouds with a schedule, I'm all set. This next one here, kind of the same kind of thing. Here we go. Number six, medieval sky battle. This might happen soon, I don't know. Aliens, who knows? Short and sweet, this one. This looks like the inside of my old high school locker, first of all, but this is actually medieval art. This Nuremberg broadsheet shows us a battle, an Avengers level threat, really, if anything. This battle took place apparently on April 14th, 1561. It was an aerial battle involving, I don't know, globes, crosses, tubes, you tell me. I don't know what's going on in the sky, but Iron Man isn't already to be found. These cigar-shaped UFOs have been breaking the internet recently, and I'm not gonna lie, they kind of look like what we're seeing in that medieval art. Maybe this is the same vehicle. Maybe it's the same battle. Maybe it's gonna happen again. People viewed this event as a divine warning. Yeah, obviously, you don't say. What else are you gonna call that? UFO is flying around. Someone's like, I have a bad feeling, Abraham. I don't know, this looks a little odd. Number five, enlisted bear. During World War II, a Polish army unit enlisted a real life Syrian brown bear named Watjek to serve with them, because yeah, what could go wrong, right? I just watched that bear movie, I don't know. Wojtek had been found as a cub in Iran by Polish soldiers, and of course adopted as their very own mascot. Again, sure, why not? Now as he grew up, Wojtek became an integral part of the unit, right? He helped carry around ammunition and other heavy supplies that only a bear could carry. Fair, I guess. And he quickly became popular among the soldiers. They all loved him. They would play with him and feed him cigarettes and beer, you named it. He loved it all. He'd eat the glass, probably. Probably. He even learned how to salute, a skill he would often perform when given um, a bottle of beer. He's like, thank you, sir. Psst. And he'd open it on his nails. So scary. So scary. Washtek's presence helped boost the morale of soldiers, and he became a beloved symbol of the unit's fighting spirit, because why, of course he did. After the war, Washtek was demobilized along with the rest of the unit, and then he spent the rest of his life at the Edinburgh Zoo in Scotland, where he continued to be a, of course, popular attraction. He's like still saluting people and stuff. They're like, it's all good, man. It's all good. You're safe now. You can chill. Today, he's still celebrated as a symbol of the bond between animals and humans and times of war. That's crazy. They got a real life bear to do that. That's terrifying. I just watched a movie about a bear doing some crazy stuff with some illicit substances and it seemed way scarier than that somehow. Number four, Violet Jessup. Violet Jessup was a British ocean liner stewardess who somehow survived three major shipwrecks in the early 20th century. Not one, not two, three. That's crazy. She's known for all these incredible tales of survival and her courage in the face of disaster, again, numerous times. First off, 1912, Jessup was working on board the RMS Titanic when it of course hit an iceberg and sank in the North Atlantic Ocean. She managed to escape on one of the lifeboats, one of the few lifeboats, might I add, and survived the disaster. Just a few years later, 1916, she was working on the HMS Britannic when it struck a mine and sank in the Aegean Sea. Again, Jessup survived and managed to make it to safety. Somehow. Now at this point you're like, okay, she's not gonna do it a third time, right? No possible way. In 1940, Jessup was working on board the RMS Queen Mary when it too collided with another ship and suffered significant damage. So once again, Jessup survived another disaster and went on to work another ocean liner for many years. Yeah, she still worked on ocean liners after all three of those. She's like, oh, it is what it is. Like what? Are you kidding me? Jessup's incredible tale of survival has of course made her a legendary figure in the history of ocean travel and a symbol of courage and resilience in the face of disaster. I'm baffled by this, that's crazy. You think after the second one, you definitely quit, right? Incredible, incredible. Number three, the Dybbuk box. I don't like haunted items. This one here, definitely a haunted item. My ears are draining as I'm doing this, so I'm like, ah. It's getting louder all of a sudden. This small wine cabinet got some attention after being sold on eBay back in 2003. Yeah, remember eBay? Me either. The box was purchased by Kevin Manis. Now, shortly after, he claimed that said box was haunted and it caused him and his family to experience a series of horrifying events and health problems. And of course, paranormal activity. How do you sell that, eh? Hey, want this? 
<laughs> no, not at all. Sounds like it's a terrible idea. He eventually sold the box to Jason Haxton, who ended up writing a book about his experience. Yeah, it was that bad. Some believe that opening this box can release malevolent spirits into the world. Now its origins here go back to a woman who survived World War II. This box came from her estate. So the history behind it, it's dark and it's seen some days, that's for sure. And now it lives at the haunted museum, rightfully so. Remember that viral video of Post Malone touching this random haunted artifact? That was this box, that was the same one. Now he's falling off stage and stuff. No, no idea what's going on with Post. Zach Baggins, please keep an eye on this box. Thank you so much. Hit that thumbs up for ghost proof glass. We really like that. It's the same glass they used in the movie 13 Ghosts. They just have that around the Dubuk box. Matthew Lillard watches it the whole time. It's lovely. Number two, Pompeii eruption. Let's hope this one doesn't happen again, cause hot. Once a flourishing Roman city located near the Bay of Naples in Italy, that was, of course, until 79 AD when Mount Vesuvius decided, eh, I'm gonna explode. I'm gonna go off and bury the entire city and all its inhabitants under layers and layers of ash and pumice. How scary and horrible is that? The eruption was so powerful that it wiped out all life within a 16 mile radius. Yeah, it makes you think about Yellowstone National Park a bit, doesn't it? Earth is terrifying. She does some random shit. Pompeii remained buried and forgotten for almost 1700 years until it was rediscovered in 1748. Today, Pompeii Pompeii is, honestly, it's amazing. It's an archeological site that offers a glimpse into ancient Roman life with well-preserved ruins of homes, public buildings, streets, artwork, you name it. There's a restaurant that's open now. They reopened a restaurant they found buried. That's incredible. And there's also a great amount of people who steal from this ancient landmark because Humans are so stupid. Yeah, how to get cursed. This is how you do it. Listen up. Tourists would steal fragments of monuments, literally pieces of the city. They would pull out and then put it in their pocket. Yeah, put a little bit of Rome and take it home on our flight. And then put out my lovely fireplace there. That's great. A hundred packages a year will get sent back to the archeological superintendents, most of them being accompanied with a letter explaining all the bad luck that occurred after they took the piece. Yeah, don't take haunted pieces of Rome home with you. Don't take Rome home. That's what they should say. I'm gonna make a shirt and say, it's because they don't take Rome home. Everyone's like, what does that even mean? I'm like, ah, watch the video. I don't know, there's a QR code on the back, scan it. And finally, number one, James Dean's haunted car. James Dean's love for fast cars was well known, but sadly, because one of them was um, haunted. Apparently, let's talk about that one. One of these cars ultimately led to his tragic death at the age of 24, but some are now convinced that all of his cars were cursed in some way, shape, or form. There's a, a car curse, if you want to call it that. Dean's first vehicle was a Triumph Tiger T1 10 motorcycle. Now, it was involved in an accident that left him with a broken leg, which, where I'm about to go with things, is not bad, considering. His next car, a Porsche 550 Spider, is the one that he famously died in after colliding head-on with another vehicle, much worse than a broken leg, in my opinion. Now, that's already tragic enough. That's dark history right there. Could probably end the point. But after Dean's death, things happened. Afterwards, the Porsche was sold off and quickly became became infamous for causing more accidents and more weird deaths. One of its owners even reported seeing the ghost of James Dean sitting in the passenger seat shortly before they crashed. That's really jarring. That's probably, that would make me crash. If I saw that beside me, I'd be like, okay, let's see you later. Now that car disappeared from public view in the late 1960s and has since been rumored to be hidden away by some collector who believes it to be cursed, so. Great, out of sight, out of mind. We love that. Another Porsche that James Dean owned was destroyed when it caught fire while being transported by a trailer. So two haunted cars. But a third Porsche that he'd ordered never made it to him because it was involved in an accident during transportation that killed that driver. So whether you believe in curses or not, there's no denying that James Dean's car collection has some dark, tragic history. Something's going on there, for sure. I don't have my license, and you know what? After that last point, I'm walking everywhere, that's it. I'm just speed walking everywhere with that big goofy belt. That's it. None of this. Just this. That's <laughs> so stupid. Man made famine that took place in Ukraine from 1932 to 1933 and was orchestrated by the Soviet government under the leadership of Joseph Stalin. It was a deliberate policy to force Ukrainian farmers to give up their crops to the Soviet government in exchange for fixed prices that were often below market rates. Stalin intended to break the resistance of the Ukrainian peasantry to Soviet collectivization and to suppress Ukrainian nationalism. As a result, an estimated three to 
seven and a half million Ukrainians died from starvation during the famine. Despite the scale of the tragedy, the Soviet government denied that the famine was happening and prevented food aid from reaching Ukraine. This event is considered by many to be an intentional slang as it targeted the Ukrainian people specifically and was carried out with the intention of causing mass death. It is a tragic example of the devastating consequences of totalitarianism and government control over food supplies. In our number 9 spot today we have the Spanish Inquisition. The Spanish Inquisition was a campaign launched by the Spanish government in the late 15th century to eliminate heresy in Spain. The Inquisition was established to root out converts to Christianity who were secretly practicing their original faith, as well as to identify and punish Jewish people who had converted to Christianity but were still suspected of adhering to their original religion. The Inquisition used torment, forced confessions, and executions to suppress what was considered heresy. The Spanish Inquisition continued for over three centuries and resulted in the persecution of tens of thousands of people. The exact number of those who were executed or otherwise punished is not known, but it is estimated that at least several thousand people were killed during this time. The Inquisition was a dark period in Spanish history and had a lasting impact on the country's culture and their politics. In our number 8 spot today we have the Reign of Terror. This was a period of violence and political repression that took place during the French Revolution from 1793 to 1794. It was marked by a series of mass executions of individuals deemed to be enemies of the revolution, as well as the widespread use of terror and intimidation to suppress political opposition. The reign of terror was instigated by radical Jacobin faction led by Maximilien Robespierre, who sought to defend the revolution against perceived enemies both within and outside of France. During this time, an estimated 16,000 to 40,000 people were executed, including many who had been prominent supporters of the revolution. The reign of terror came to an end in July of 1794 when Robespierre and his closest associates were arrested and executed. The reign of terror was quite a dark chapter in French history and left a lasting legacy of fear and violence in the collective memory of the French people. In our number 7 spot today we have the trail. The trail of blood is a term used to describe a series of killings and human rights violations committed by Brazilian cattle ranchers against indigenous people in the Amazon rainforest in the 1980s and the 1990s. The violence was driven by the expansion of the ranching industry which required the clearing of large areas of forest for grazing land. Indigenous communities and isolated tribes who lived in these areas were often seen as an obstacle to this expansion and were forcibly removed or killed. Many of the killings were carried out by people who were hired known as pistoleros and they operated with the complicity of local government officials. The violence led to the displacement of thousands of indigenous people and the destruction of their traditional way of life. The Trail of Blood has been a major issue in Brazilian politics and has sparked international outrage and calls for greater protection of indigenous rights and the Amazon rainforest. In our number 6 spot today we have the Great Chinese Famine. This famine was a catastrophic period in Chinese history that lasted from 1958 to 1962 during the leadership of Mao Zedong. The famine was the result of a series of of policies including the Great Leap Forward which aimed to rapidly modernize China's economy and agriculture. These policies resulted in the collectivization of agriculture and the forced requisitioning of crops which led to a significant decrease in food production. In addition, environmental factors such as floods and droughts only exacerbated the famine. It is estimated that anywhere from 15 to 45 million people died as a result of the famine and related policies, making it one of the deadliest famines in human history. The Chinese government under Mao Zedong denied the existence of the famine and prevented food aid from reaching those in need. The Great Chinese Famine remains a tragic reminder of the devastating impact of misguided government policies on the lives of millions of people. In our number 5 spot today we have The Wave. On January 15th, 1919 in Boston, there was a huge massive storage tank that was filled to the brim with molasses. Okay, We're talking about 2.3 million gallons of this stuff sitting in this tank and on that day the tank broke and set a 15 foot tall wave of sticky gooey syrup flowing throughout the city. I panic when I have like a tablespoon of that stuff because it's so sticky and goopy. I can't imagine the sight of 2.3 million gallons coming crashing down. Someone wrote about how the molasses wave hit houses in the area saying that they quote seemed to cringe up as though they were made of pasteboard. Well this story Sounds like really silly and wacky, 
oh my gosh, it's molasses. It was actually very deadly. Not only did the wave trap and then kill most of the laborers that were nearby, but there were others in the area who lost their lives as well. In the end, it is estimated that about 150 people were injured in this accident, and 21 people lost their lives. It is estimated that on the day of the accident, the molasses was moving at about 35 miles per hour. That would be genuinely terrifying. You can't run away from it. You can't escape into a house. There's literally nothing you can do except for try and surf this massive wave of molasses. In the end, after a ton of lawsuits, it was decided that the company was to blame for the accident because their inspections of the tank weren't thorough enough. There were about 100 settlements made out of court and the company ended up paying somewhere from 500,000 to a million dollars in the end, which is about 16.1 million dollars in today's money. In our number four spot today, we have the Belgian Congo. This was a period of colonial rule by Belgium in the Congo from 1885 to 1960. During this time, the Belgian government exploited the natural resources of the Congo, particularly rubber, ivory, and minerals, through the use of forced labor and brutal violence. Congolese people were forced to work long hours under harsh conditions, and they were punished severely if they failed to meet production quotas. The Belgian government also used violent repression to maintain control over the Congolese people, with estimates of millions Millions of Congolese deaths during this period. The Congo's wealth was exploited for the benefit of the Belgian colonizers and the international economy, with little to no benefit to the Congolese people. The exploitation and violence of the Belgian Congo has had a lasting impact on the country and its people, and the scars of the period are still felt today. In our number three spot today, we have St. Bryce's Day. St. Bryce's Day was a dark event that occurred in England on November 13th, 1002, when King Ethelred the unready ordered the slaying of all Danes living in England. The order was given in response to Viking raids on England and it resulted in the deaths of thousands of people. The massacre was particularly brutal as people were killed in their homes and churches and many were burned alive. The Danes had been living in England for generations and many had converted to Christianity and were assimilated into English society and the massacre had a very significant impact on Anglo-Danish relations and it led to a long period of conflict between England and Denmark. In our number two spot today, we have the Partition of India. The Partition of India was a major event that occurred in 1947, resulting in the division of British India into two separate countries, India and Pakistan. The Partition was based on religious lines, with India being predominantly Hindu and Pakistan being predominantly Muslim. The decision to divide the country was made by the British government, and it led to widespread violence, displacement, and loss of life. Millions of people were forced to leave their homes and moved to the other side of the border, leading to one of the largest mass migrations in human history. Estimates of the death toll range from 200,000 to 2 million people. The partition also created long-standing tensions between India and Pakistan, including disputes over territory, resources, and religious identity. The legacy of the partition continues to shape politics and society in South Asia today. And finally, in our number one spot, we have the year 530. For this one, we are taking it pretty far back, all the way to year 536, because this is widely regarded as the worst year to have been alive. In modern times, a lot of our terrible things that have happened and terrible times we have lived through have been because of the things that we as humans do, as evidenced by all of the horrific things we've talked about so far. This was, of course, still the case in 536 as well, but they faced something much larger in this year that truthfully wasn't anyone's fault at all. In 500 in 1936, there was one of the worst global famines in human history because there was a lack of sunlight at the time. The earth used to be a very different place, and during these times, there were a series of large volcanic eruptions which sent volcanic ash into the air, thus blocking the light of the sun. This effectively dropped the temperature of the earth, so people had to live in the cold for 18 months, and many people ended up passing away due to starvation, famine, and cold. This, coupled with the brutal conflicts that could be seen in many parts of the world at the time, it totally makes sense that this year would be regarded as one of the worst in all of history. Starting off this list, in our number 10 spot, we have the Mad Bomber. This is a photo that was taken of someone known as the Mad Bomber. His real name is George Metzke, and he was the man who terrorized New York City for 16 years while he planted explosives in public places like an absolute psychopath. I guess he was apparently angry about a workplace injury he had suffered in the years prior to his terrible crimes, and so of course the normal reasonable jump to make would be 
Um, not that at all. While no one should have ever had to suffer because of these crimes, the good news is that while he planted 33 bombs and set off 22 of them, miraculously only 15 people ended up injured in the end. This photo of him behind bars is extremely eerie thanks to his creepy smile and haunting eyes. I might be the only one who feels it, but it just seems like something's off. You know? In our number 9 spot today, we have the figures of the fire. This photo is both extremely unsettling and super captivating as it shows a scene after the great fire at Madame Tussauds in 1925. Of course, this wax museum is famous for the extremely lifelike wax figures that are created and find their home there, so you can only imagine the aftermath of the fire. These lifelike figures with missing heads and appendages, burnt skin and hair, and just clothing in disarray. Seeing this photo for the first time without knowing the story behind it was definitely a bit of a confusing and terrifying experience. The heads on the ground really freaked me out for a full 5 seconds. As scary as it is, I'm glad to hear it's not real and just some creative casualties rather than what this photo appears to be at first. In our number 8 spot today, we have the Spectre. This is a photo that was taken in England in 1963, and it became known as the Spectre of the Newbie Church. That is, of course, because of the ghostly figure that can be seen in the photo. I personally am always a little suspicious of ghost photos. Some are certainly more convincing than others, but Photoshop in 1963 wasn't exactly as accessible and easy as it is now. This photo is said to have been taken by Reverend K. F. Lord inside of the Newbie Church, which is located in North Yorkshire, England. Of course, I mean, like many of us are going to do, people were really skeptical of this apparition and just believed it was a well done case of double exposure, which to be fair, is entirely possible. The reverend continued to swear up and down however that the photo was not doctored, so at this point, there's no proof to prove either side and it's just a game of he said she said. So what do you guys think? Apparition caught slipping or is the reverend just making it up? In our number 7 spot today we have the Tsar Bomba. This is a photo that was taken on October 30th, 1961, it was quite the Halloween spooky fright that year as this is said to be the largest and most powerful nuclear weapon ever created and tested. The hydrogen aerial bomb was developed in the Soviet Union by a group of nuclear physicists that were under the leadership of Igor Kurchatov. The bomb was dropped by parachute and was detonated autonomously. While this test was meant to be a secret, turned out to be less than well kept as it was obviously a huge explosion that was detected by United States intelligence agencies. A secret US recon aircraft called Speed Light Alpha was there monitoring the explosion and it got so close that it had its anti-radiation paint absolutely scorched off. The photo clearly shows the bomb as it exploded and it is said that this bomb was 5,000 times stronger than the ones that were dropped on Japan during World War II. That's not to say that those ones weren't strong because they were absolutely devastating, it's just an example to show how large this one really was. In our number 6 spot today we have the Three Jacksons. On August 21st, 19 1934, three fearless acrobats known as the Three Jacksons, Charlie Smith, Jewel Waddick, and Jimmy Kerrigan, all performed a routine on the edge of the Empire State Building, which is when this photo was captured. It is said that these three toured as an acrobatic trio, and this stunt the photo captured was done at 1,245 feet. According to officials from the Empire State Building, it is said that this was the first time the stunt was attempted, and to this day, it has never been done again, which makes a lot of sense. While this photo is absolutely incredible and is such a testament not only to the trust that they shared but also their abilities as acrobats, I don't know who in their right mind would try to recreate this. We already have one, I think we can just all be happy with that. In our number 5 spot today we have the Gentleman of Rehi. This photo shows the Gentleman of Rehi and that is not a gentleman and instead is the world's oldest surviving diving suit. It is an absolutely terrifying sight but also an important pillar that allowed for this kind of technology to develop Develop to what it is today. The suit date back to the early 18th century, but it came to find its home at the Rehi Museum during the 1860s after it was donated. The suit was initially designed to allow people the ability to check the hull of ships without having to bring them into dry dock. The old gentleman is made mostly of leather with pitch thread used to stitch the seams. From here, the suit is sealed with more pitch, and then to create the waterproof coat, it is covered in a mixture of mutton tallow, tar, and pitch. Of course, underwater pressure increases 
increases dramatically and this is why there's also wooden framework in the hood in order to keep it from collapsing under the pressure. At the top of the hood there is an opening for a wooden air pipe. The air would be pumped to the diver then it could be released from the suit through a pipe on the backside. Of course this means that the suit wasn't completely watertight so divers could only go under for a short period and couldn't dive very deep because there was only so much pressure the suit could take but still the suit was far better than having no suit at all. In our number 4 spot today we have ectoplasm. This photo is said to have been taken in 1910 and it shows a medium in the middle of a spiritual seance. I don't know about you but a 1910 seance sounds like an absolutely terrifying time. This photo is said to be catching the moment that ectoplasm appears out of the mouth of the medium. When we're talking about the occult and the paranormal ectoplasm is a viscous substance that exudes from a spiritual entity or sometimes the earthbound medium who is connected to or communicating with the spirit. It is said that this substance can take the shape of a face or a hand or a complete body and it's usually seen in a darkened room during a sort of seance and this is the way that the paranormal can physically manifest themselves in our world. So basically what I'm saying is that this is supposed to be the moment that an evil entity is making themselves known in our world. Thankfully at the end of the contact with the spirit the ectoplasm will usually disappear as it returns to the entity so it hopefully didn't stay around long but this photo sure is something. In our number 3 spot today we have the isolator. There are tons of strange inventions from the past. We have entire lists and videos dedicated to the strange inventions. There's so many. And while this is one that can be added to the list of bizarre inventions, it can also be added to the list of creepy ones as well. This photo shows what was meant to be a sort of anti-distraction contraption from the 1920s. Listen. I can get easily distracted so sometimes I need a little help but this thing really takes it to a new level. It essentially makes it impossible for the person to look at anything other than what is directly in front of them or you know breathe. It seems like a contraption that requires an oxygen tank hookup probably isn't going to be the best anti-distraction device. In fact, I think that's probably more distracting than anything. Honestly, I'm such a good procrastinator that even with this thing, I still wouldn't get my work done. Thankfully, this device didn't stick around or gain much popularity and now it is just a terrifying relic of the past. In our number 2 spot today, we have the Great Manta. In 1933, a New York silk manufacturer named A. L. Kahn was on a nice little vacation in Florida when he honestly accidentally caught something remarkable. His anchor line, by mistake, caught onto a giant manta ray. After a struggle and several hours, Khan was able to get this actually enormous fish ashore. This monster was somewhere between 5,000 to 6,000 pounds and was 20 feet and 5 inches in width. For reference, there are other giant manta rays, but they usually grow to be around 13 to 14 feet wide, not 20 and a half. This photo is showing a taxidermy version of the fish which Khan used to bring around to exhibitions to show off his accidental cash. In an article from December 10th, 1933 of the St. Louis Post Dispatches Sunday Magazine, Khan is quoted as saying, fishing is a lot of fun when you catch the fish, and sometimes it's fun even when you don't, but when the fish catches you. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have the advertisement. This is a photo that comes to us from the time of World War II, and it shows a very terrifying kind of ad. The sign reads, these men didn't take their adabrine, and at first I had absolutely no idea what that was. Turns out that adabrine was actually the first synthetic form of a drug which was used by the US military to fight malaria in the South Pacific during the war. It is estimated that as many as two thirds of the troops fell ill with malaria. This sign is said to have been posted outside of a military hospital in New Guinea and was meant to serve as a warning for those who didn't take the medicine, warning that the skulls on top would be the fate that awaited them. Perhaps a little dark, but creative and likely effective nonetheless. At the very least, the ad is definitely quite clear. Starting our list off at number 10, Lake Neos. We love talking about Pompeii. We can't get enough of it. I'm fascinated. They have a restaurant that's back and open now in Pompeii. It's crazy. Now that's quite the eruption. Historically, that's a bad one. That's pretty scary. But a recent eruption in 1986, well, we don't talk about this one enough. First of all, a limnic eruption is a rare event, so you can sleep not in fear tonight. It occurs when CO2 dissolved in deep water lakes suddenly erupts. 
Cause uh, yeah, that can happen. Who knew that? That's why I don't like lakes. There you go, right there. These events have only been observed twice, the deadliest being Lake Neos in 1986. When a limnic eruption occurs, large clouds of CO2 form, which then all of a sudden descend and drop below the oxygen in the air, causing all living things in the vicinity to choke and not survive anymore. In this case, the cloud fell on nearby villages, ultimately causing the deaths of 1,700 people and 3,500 livestock. Number nine, the Spanish flu of 1918. The Spanish flu of 1918. Okay, yeah, this one's probably pretty good. Since we know a little something about plagues now in real life and toilet paper and stress, let's turn the clocks back 95 years when the Spanish flu entered the game. What was it like back then? The Spanish flu, if you didn't know, it was a strain of the H1N1 virus, which we all know as well. And when it hit, it took 50 to 100 million people very fast. 4% of the world's population gone. Now, it was recent and it was quite horrible. We couldn't stay home and watch Ozark for that one, so instead the Spanish flu is said to have spread so violently because of soldiers being in close quarters during World War I. Yeah, again, very different than our plague. Immune systems were shot as is, and you're telling me a plague rolled through while we're in trenches? No way, what a nightmare. But just like that, the virus disappeared. Better treatment, perhaps it mutated into a much weaker strain. Either way, Great, stay gone, get out of here. Go away and stay there, pal. Hit that thumbs up for the Spanish flu not being around. Awesome, we love that. It's a good one to not have. Number eight, the great dying. This name's pretty accurate, if I'm being honest myself. Scariest environment imaginable, here we go. Turning the clocks and solar system back 252 million years ago, the Permian-Triassic extinction, which for convenience sake we'll call the great dying, was and hopefully shall remain the largest extinction event on Earth. The fact that we're even alive right now, watching this video, clicking that thumbs up and subscribing, well, it's all pretty rare, all things considered. This was a butterfly effect triggered by a massive volcanic eruption around the Serbian traps in Russia. A runaway greenhouse effect was responsible for the loss of 95% of all marine life and 70% of all land animals. That's so everything pretty much. Pretty much everything's gone. Temperatures rose as the sea began to absorb large quantities of CO2 from the atmosphere. Mentioned that a little earlier and that could not be great. And it began turning into carbonic acid, hence all that marine life that didn't make it. Methane hydrate then started to bubble from the ocean surface which is horrifying to imagine, and it raised the temperature even higher at that point. Now, imagine if this didn't happen. We'd have those scary sharks still swimming around. We're remnants of the surviving 4% of the great dying. Yeah, to all your friends that. I'm gonna add that to my LinkedIn. That sounds not half bad. Yeah, I survived the great dying, so yeah. Really good at scooping ice cream. Let's do it. Number seven, Maximilien Robespierre. On July 27th, 1794, French revolutionary Maximilien Robespierre and 21 of his followers were all arrested at the Hotel de Ville in Paris. Now, considering that this was 1794 and we got arrested, what follows is sure to be a public nightmare. The next day, Robespierre and again, 21 of his followers were all taken to the Palace de Revolution where they were all executed by guillotine before a cheering crowd. Always a cheering crowd, of course. What, are, what else are we doing today? Let's go watch. What history tends to leave out of this part is that Maximilian tempted to take his own life beforehand because he knew his fate was gonna suck with the whole you know, thing. But when he tried to take his own life, he survived and was left instead with a nasty jaw wound. So in Game of Thrones fashion, the executioner, when the time came, ripped the jaw bandage off first and then he saw the guillotine. Yeah, again, to a cheering crowd, remember? They all watch this, all this unfold. I can't even watch UFC sometimes. You're telling me people watch this? IRL? That's, I'm gonna go throw up real quick. Be right back. Number six, the eruption. Mount Pinatubo, which is located in the Philippines, was another volcanic eruption that shook up history. A little more recent than the other one. This was on June 15th, 1991. Mount Pinatubo, this massive volcano, erupted into what would be the second largest volcanic eruption of the 20th century. Impressive? Yes. Terrifying? Absolutely. Yep, yeah, this is very loud and scary. Activity in the volcano first started on April 2nd, 1991. And these things take a little time to, you know, finish up. So that same year, researchers set up seismographs in the area, and by June, the volcano was having a group of progressively shallower eruptions. And then on June 12th, the volcano had its first spectacular eruption, which sent hot ash 19 kilometers up into the atmosphere, which then rained on down to everything around it, which is the worst thing I can imagine. Additional smaller eruptions continued on June 13th, which then led to some intense seismic activity. And 
then, on June 15th, the volcano once again went off, this time sending a cloud of ash 40 kilometers into the atmosphere. So, bye bye sun for a little bit. This one's gonna linger. Number five, the Challenger crew. This is a photo that was taken of the, well, clearly the very excited Challenger crew right before when they were walking down the ramp ready to head off on their mission. Now, this photo is chilling, but it's nice to see them happy and together. The crew even included, at the time, 37-year-old Kristen McAuliffe, who was a high school social studies teacher. You may remember this, but your parents definitely do. See, she had won a spot on the mission through a program with NASA called the Teacher in Space Program. Program. And she had trained diligently for months in order to be the first ever non-military individual in space. On January 28th, 1986, the Challenger mission proved to be fateful just 73 seconds after liftoff. See, two rubber O-rings failed because of the cold temperatures that morning, and on live television, the world had to watch as a spacecraft broke apart and then fell into the ocean, sadly taking the lives of everybody on board the craft. Now, I'm not sure if you've watched the documentary on Netflix, but it's a mini-series about this whole Thing and it's powerful stuff. It's really emotional, I just finished it and it's moving. Number four, the core. <clears throat> this photo shows a physicist named Harold Agnew and while this photo looks relatively normal and scientific or whatever, a non-threatening photo, what he has in his hands is truly devastating. It changed history. Harold is holding the nuclear core of what was nicknamed the Fat Man. Yeah, that thing. This means that Harold is now holding the nuclear core of the atomic weapon that was later dropped on Nagasaki in 1945. The immediate blast took many, many lives, as well as the long-term effects of radiation illnesses. Now, it's crazy to look at a photo like this because it seems so perfectly normal when he literally has a life-changing, world-ending device in the palm of his hand, like a literal supervillain holding kryptonite. I couldn't imagine seeing that, let alone holding it. No way. My grandmother wouldn't even hold me as a baby because I was too small and fragile. <laughs> Think she'd hold this? No way. Butterfingers. Butterfingers galore over there. Number three, the ball of burning men. January 28th, 1393. You are formal invited to a masquerade ball. How fun is that? <laughs> Who is it under that mask? Oh, it's just Taylor on Bumblebee. Love him. He's great. The French Queen Isabeau of Bavaria is now hosting one of the most lavish parties of the decade, right? So bring your finest and longest crook house. Roll it in style. Now, when the French royal court was celebrating the marriage of one of the Queen's ladies in waiting, it of course was a big deal. It's fun. It's a big happy day. For some, the best days of their lives. For others at this ball, not so great. Probably the last days of their lives. King Charles Charles VI had five companions perform a dance or a theater routine of sorts. Now they did a performance as beasts. They were committed to the bin, right? They had these big, lovely masks, big baggy outfits, lots of linen, lots of stuffing to appear as if they were real beasts. Now the party was going well, wine was spilling, people were laughing, beasts were roaring, we were committed, but one rule beforehand was put into place before the party started. Absolutely, positively, no open flames. Obviously, right? I mean, look at that guy. He looks like a couch. We're not gonna put a match near him. It's gonna be chaos. The Duke of Orleans had a little too much fun prior to this event, and he forgot the first rule of Fight Club when he arrived. The guy walked in with a lit torch. He wanted to see everyone. Some accounts say he dropped the torch by accident. Others say he got too close trying to guess the identity of said beasts. Either way, this tragic event took the lives of four people, hence the name, Ball of the Burning Men. That's terrible, imagine that, what a gig. Number two, the Stanford Prison Experiment. One of the most well-known experiments of all time was the Stanford Prison Experiment. It was an attempt to investigate the psychological effects of perceived power, and it worked. A little too well, I'd say. Guards and prisoners were all chosen randomly from college students to anyone, your neighbor. You had no idea. Nobody really knew just how bad this experiment would end up, so anyone volunteered. Those in power were taking it to an extreme level. It was absolute psychological distress. Some of the prisoners went insane. The whole exercise was abandoned after only six days, which is not a short amount of time, but historians say just six days because it was intended to last much longer. Now, it's shocking to see the lengths people go after receiving power over another human being. I thought I was evil unplugging my brother's controller and like playing, you know, and he wasn't plugged in. This is like... Next level. And finally, number one, mummified pets. Are you a pet owner? If so, comment down below which animals fill your house. We love that. Olivia and I want to get a dog so bad. I was always a dog guy growing up. My aunt had three pugs. It was the dream. I love it. Ancient Egyptians, they fancied a house pet or two. We know this. But Egyptians saw animals as incarnations of the gods, which I do too with my shih tzu, of course. The very concept of having a pet came from ancient Egyptians, so thank you. Egyptians were, of course, fans of cats. That's common knowledge at this point. 
time. But did you know they also had the same idea for hawks, lions, dogs, and baboons? Yeah, baboons. That's amazing. Go ask your parents for a baboon as a pet. There you go. I thought dogs doing their business inside was annoying, but a lion? Your arm's gonna be tired scooping that one up. Many of these animals were often mummified and buried with their owners after they'd passed, just like how many owners today cremate their pets. I mean, I'm not sure I would mummify a shih tzu, but hey, whatever floats your boat. Who am I to judge? Other creatures were specially trained to work as helper animals back then. So ancient Egyptian police officers would use dogs and monkeys to help patrolling, then they'd mummify them. What a time, imagine that. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the Holodomor. This event was a man-made famine that took place in Ukraine from 1932 to 1933 and was orchestrated by the Soviet government under the leadership of Joseph Stalin. It was a deliberate policy to force Ukrainian farmers to give up their crops to the Soviet government in exchange for fixed prices that were often below market rates. Stalin intended to break the resistance of the Ukrainian peasantry to Soviet collectivization and to suppress Ukrainian nationalism. As a result, an estimated three to seven and a half million Ukrainians died from starvation during the famine. Despite the scale of the tragedy, the Soviet government denied that the famine was happening and prevented food aid from reaching Ukraine. This event is considered by many to be an intentional slang as it targeted the Ukrainian people specifically and was carried out with the intention of causing mass death. It is a tragic example of the devastating consequences of totalitarianism and government control over food supplies. In our number 9 spot today we have the Spanish Inquisition. The Spanish Inquisition was a campaign launched by the Spanish government in the late 15th century to eliminate heresy in Spain. The Inquisition was established to root out converts to Christianity who were secretly practicing their original faith, as well as to identify and punish Jewish people who had converted to Christianity but were still suspected of adhering to their original religion. The Inquisition used torment, forced confessions, and executions to suppress what was considered heresy. The Spanish Inquisition continued for over three centuries and resulted in the persecution of tens of thousands of people. The exact number of those who were executed or otherwise punished is not known, but it is estimated that at least several thousand people were killed during this time. The Inquisition was a dark period in Spanish history and had a lasting impact on the country's culture and their politics. In our number 8 spot today we have the Reign of Terror. This was a period of violence and political repression that took place during during the French Revolution from 1793 to 1794. It was marked by a series of mass executions of individuals deemed to be enemies of the revolution, as well as the widespread use of terror and intimidation to suppress political opposition. The Reign of Terror was instigated by radical Jacobin faction led by Maximilien Robespierre, who sought to defend the revolution against perceived enemies both within and outside of France. During this time, an estimated 16,000 to 40,000 thousand people were executed, including many who had been prominent supporters of the revolution. The reign of terror came to an end in July of 1794 when Robespierre and his closest associates were arrested and executed. The reign of terror was quite a dark chapter in French history and left a lasting legacy of fear and violence in the collective memory of the French people. In our number 7 spot today we have the trail. The trail of blood is a term used to describe a series of killings and human rights violations committed by Brazilian cattle ranchers against indigenous people in the Amazon rainforest in the 1980s and the 1990s. The violence was driven by the expansion of the ranching industry, which required the clearing of large areas of forest for grazing land. Indigenous communities and isolated tribes who lived in these areas were often seen as an obstacle to this expansion and were forcibly removed or killed. Many of the killings were carried out by people who were hired, known as pistoleros, and they operated with the complicity of local government officials. The violence led to the displacement of thousands of indigenous people and the destruction of their traditional way of life. The Trail of Blood has been a major issue in Brazilian politics and has sparked international outrage and calls for greater protection of indigenous rights and the Amazon rainforest. In our number 6 spot today we have the Great Chinese Famine. This famine was a catastrophic period in Chinese history that lasted from 1958 to 1962 during the leadership of Mao. 
Zedong. The famine was the result of a series of policies including the Great Leap Forward which aimed to rapidly modernize China's economy and agriculture. These policies resulted in the collectivization of agriculture and the forced requisitioning of crops which led to a significant decrease in food production. In addition, environmental factors such as floods and droughts only exacerbated the famine. It is estimated that anywhere from 15 to 45 million people died as a result of the famine and related policies, making it one of the deadliest famines in human history. The Chinese government under Mao Zedong denied the existence of the famine and prevented food aid from reaching those in need. The Great Chinese Famine remains a tragic reminder of the devastating impact of misguided government policies on the lives of millions of people. In our number 5 spot today we have The Wave. On January 15th, 1919 in Boston, there was a huge, massive storage tank that was filled to the brim with molasses. Okay, We're talking about 2.3 million gallons of this stuff sitting in this tank and on that day the tank broke and set a 15 foot tall wave of sticky gooey syrup flowing throughout the city. I panic when I have like a tablespoon of that stuff because it's so sticky and goopy. I can't imagine the sight of 2.3 million gallons coming crashing down. Someone wrote about how the molasses wave hit houses in the area saying that they quote seemed to cringe up as though they were made of pasteboard. Well this story sounds like really silly and wacky, oh my gosh it's molasses. It was actually very deadly. Not only did the wave trap and then kill most of the laborers that were nearby, but there were others in the area who lost their lives as well. In the end it is estimated that about 150 people were injured in this accident and 21 people lost their lives. It is estimated that on the day of the accident the molasses was moving at about 35 miles per hour. That would be genuinely terrifying. You can't run away from it. You can't escape into a house. There's literally nothing you can do except for try and surf this massive wave of molasses. In the end, after a ton of lawsuits, it was decided that the company was to blame for the accident because their inspections of the tank weren't thorough enough. There were about 100 settlements made out of court and the company ended up paying somewhere from 500,000 to a million dollars in the end, which is about 16.1 million dollars in today's money. In our number four spot today, we have the Belgian Congo. This was a period of colonial rule by Belgium in the Congo from 1885 to 1960. During this time, the Belgian government exploited the natural resources of the Congo, particularly rubber, ivory, and minerals, through the use of forced labor and brutal violence. Congolese people were forced to work long hours under harsh conditions, and they were punished severely if they failed to meet production quotas. The Belgian government also used violent repression to maintain control over the Congolese people, with estimates of millions Millions of Congolese deaths during this period. The Congo's wealth was exploited for the benefit of the Belgian colonizers and the international economy, with little to no benefit to the Congolese people. The exploitation and violence of the Belgian Congo has had a lasting impact on the country and its people, and the scars of the period are still felt today. In our number three spot today, we have St. Bryce's Day. St. Bryce's Day was a dark event that occurred in England on November 13th, 1002, when King Ethelred the unready ordered the slaying of all Danes living in England. The order was given in response to Viking raids on England and it resulted in the deaths of thousands of people. The massacre was particularly brutal as people were killed in their homes and churches and many were burned alive. The Danes had been living in England for generations and many had converted to Christianity and were assimilated into English society and the massacre had a very significant impact on Anglo-Danish relations and it led to a long period of conflict between England and Denmark. In our number two spot today, we have the Partition of India. The Partition of India was a major event that occurred in 1947, resulting in the division of British India into two separate countries, India and Pakistan. The Partition was based on religious lines, with India being predominantly Hindu and Pakistan being predominantly Muslim. The decision to divide the country was made by the British government, and it led to widespread violence, displacement, and loss of life. Millions of people were forced to leave their homes and moved to the other side of the border, leading to one of the largest mass migrations in human history. Estimates of the death toll range from 200,000 to 2 million people. The partition also created long-standing tensions between India and Pakistan, including disputes over territory, resources, and religious identity. The legacy of the partition continues to shape politics and society in South Asia today. And finally, in our number one spot, we have the year 530. 
536. For this one, we are taking it pretty far back, all the way to year 536, because this is widely regarded as the worst year to have been alive. In modern times, a lot of our terrible things that have happened and terrible times we have lived through have been because of the things that we as humans do, as evidenced by all of the horrific things we've talked about so far. This was, of course, still the case in 536 as well, but they faced something much larger in this year that truthfully wasn't anyone's fault at all. In 536, there was one of the worst global famines in human history because there was a lack of sunlight at the time. The Earth used to be a very different place, and during these times, there were a series of large volcanic eruptions which sent volcanic ash into the air, thus blocking the light of the sun. This effectively dropped the temperature of the earth, so people had to live in the cold for 18 months, and many people ended up passing away due to starvation, famine, and cold. This, coupled with the brutal conflicts that could be seen in many parts of the world at the time, it totally makes sense that this year would be regarded as one of the worst in all of history. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Luis Garavito. Luis gained a nickname from the media of The Beast, and I think that's a great indication of the nature of his atrocious crimes. He is said to be one of the worst serial killers in the entire world, and it is believed that his victim count is up in the 300s range, which is absolutely shocking. He confessed to 147 crimes, and he was found guilty on 139 of those counts, which put his sentence at 1,853 years. But here's the thing. This trial took place in Colombia, where he lives, and there is a law, or was a law, which puts the maximum sentence to 30 years. He was sentenced in 1999, meaning there's really only a few years left of this sentence. He also had years taken off of his sentence because he assisted police in the search to recover some of the victim's bodies, which means that just this year, in 2023, he is eligible for parole. Okay, that's great. According to Luis himself, he committed these crimes because he had made a deal with the devil, and he explained that satanic ritual was involved in all of his crimes. In our number nine spot today, we have William Bonin. This horrible person is said to be responsible for taking the lives of 21 young men in Southern California from May of 1979 to June of 1980. It is said that on at least 12 of these occasions, he was assisted by one of his four known accomplices, and it is even speculated that he might be responsible for 15 more of these crimes that evidence hasn't officially been able to connect him to. He was often referred to as the freeway killer because of the fact that most of the bodies were found along the freeway of Southern California. The police surveilled William until they could catch him in the act, which they did. In the beginning, he claimed innocence, but after receiving an impassioned letter from one of the victim's mothers, which asked him to please share the location of her son's body, he confessed his guilt. But he made sure to clarify that it wasn't so the mother could be at peace and her pain could be eased. No, of course not. Instead, he said, quote, I was dying for a hamburger and I knew if I went out with the cops, they would get me a hamburger. Right, just gonna take a moment and let that sink in. At his first trial, the prosecutor described him as, quote, the most arch evil person who ever existed. William was convicted on 14 of his crimes and was sentenced to death. He spent 14 years on death row before his sentence was carried out in 1996. In our number 8 spot today, we have Robert Hansen. Robert is often referred to as the Butcher Baker, and his story truly is horrific. He is one of the most prolific serial killers in Alaska's history, because for over a decade he would kidnap women and bring them into the wilderness, where he would then stalk them like prey. The reason he got away with his crimes for so long is because outside of these horrifying crimes, he was just a soft-spoken baker. Robert was heading to church by day and prowling the streets by night. What led to the downfall of this horrible monster was a badass named Cindy Paulson, who was able to escape from Robert and was sure to leave evidence behind. She then went to authorities and told them what happened, and this led to a search warrant for Robert's property, which is where all the evidence they needed lied. Robert is believed to have taken the lives of at least 17 women, and in 1983, he was sentenced to 461 years and a life sentence without the possibility of parole. In our number seven spot today, we have Vicki Dawn Jackson. Vicki was a woman who worked as a nurse for a number 
of years. She first got her nursing license in 1989, but it wasn't until the 2000s when things took a seriously dark turn. Between December of 2000 and February of 2001, the hospital that Vicky was working for recorded a number of deaths that was unusual. It was a much higher amount. Most of these patients were in the age range of 60 to 100 years old. Of course, people just chalked this up to the advanced age of most of these patients, but a rumor began to spread that someone might actually be responsible. After this, the hospital's administrator noticed that a vial of a drug called Mivacron had gone missing. You might see where I'm going with this. As it turns out, the person responsible was Nurse Vicky, and she had at least 10 patients whose lives she took by giving them too much of this missing it was a muscle relaxant. Take in that this is 10 people between December and February. That is an unbelievable amount of people in a remarkably short amount of time. You might be wondering why she took these lives, and apparently she did it when she found those people rude or quote, too demanding. Okay, Vicky, get a different job then. I don't know. In our number six spot today, we have Michael Bear Carson and Susan Carson. This couple is not one that anyone would want to encounter. The stories of these two come from the 80s. They were married, and on the outside, they appear just like a happy couple of harmless hippies. We all know, though, not to judge a book by its cover. In the end, they would go on to become known as the San Francisco Witch Killers. Didn't know San Francisco held so many witches. Basically, together, the pair took the lives of three separate people between 1981 in 1983. They started off by killing their roommate, who Susan claimed was a witch, and said that she was stealing her quote, health, power, and beauty. They next killed one guy that they worked with on a farm because they said that he was a demon. The final person they took the life of unfortunately picked up the pair as they were hitchhiking, and they took his life because they claimed he was a quote, black witch, whatever that means. Essentially, they were just committing crimes against people that they claimed to be witches. The pair were each tried and convicted for each separate crime and are both serving sentences of 75 years to life. Neither of them have ever shown any kind of remorse for what they've done. In our number five spot today, we have Stephen Griffiths. This is a person who is said to have idolized the Yorkshire Ripper, so I'm sure what comes next will be no surprise. Stephen was a PhD student who wanted to achieve fame, but through the most sinister way possible. Between June of 2009 and May of 2010, he would go on to take the lives of three separate women. His criminal history was also extremely concerning as years ago, he had been arrested due to an unprovoked attack on a grocery store manager, and it is said that he previously stated that he saw himself becoming a serial Shortly after he was arrested for his crimes, CCTV footage emerged that showed him celebrating after taking the life of his final victim. The footage showed him holding up a crossbow and giving the finger directly to the camera. It is said that Stephen pled guilty to his crimes once caught, not because he was remorseful, but because he wanted to receive the recognition for them. In our number four spot today, we have Joanna Denny. This is the person responsible for a series of killings and attacks that took place in March of 2013. Joanna is a very cold and very heartless person person and has, on many occasions, been said to laugh at her crimes and the lives she took, even still behind bars. After the first of her crimes, authorities launched a manhunt for her and they used CCTV footage to help track her down. She was finally caught after attacking two dog walkers who, thanks to immediate medical intervention, were able to survive. There are many, many things about this story that make it exceptionally chilling, and it seems as though most people Joanna encounters are left with quite an impression of what a horrible person she really is. On the day she was sentenced, it is reported that the judge, Mr. Justice Spencer, said, quote, although you pleaded guilty, you've made it quite clear you have no remorse. He went on to say, quote, you are a cruel, calculating, selfish, and manipulative serial after this, he sentenced her to a whole life order, or life in prison without parole, and it is said that she smiled and laughed at this. Since her time in prison, she is said to have planned escape attempts that involved the killing of a prison guard and other terrifying ideas. In our number three spot today, we have Elizabeth Wetlaufer. Elizabeth is a former registered nurse and serial who is responsible for taking the lives of eight and attempting to take the lives of another six senior citizens who were under her care. With a total of 14 victims that either passed away or were harmed by her actions, she is now one of the worst serial killers Canada has ever seen. And not to mention how she was doing these things to vulnerable people that she was supposed to have devoted her life to taking care of. Her first victim who passed away was James Silcox, who was 84 in 2007 and was a World War II veteran. She committed her crimes 
times by injecting insulin into her patients. In September of 2016, Liz ended up entering herself into a drug rehabilitation program at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, which is located here in Toronto. It was here that she ended up confessing to her horrific crimes. Of course, the staff at the hospital notified the proper authorities, and she was subsequently arrested and she gave police a two hour confession. She admitted to knowing what she did was wrong, but she also just said that she had urges she couldn't control. She stated that quote, God or the devil or whatever wanted me to do it. In the end, she was sentenced to life in prison, but because of the way that the Canadian system works, she will at some point be eligible for parole and hopefully denied. All right. In our number two spot today, we have Kevin Davis. The story behind this killer is truly one of the most disturbing things I have ever heard in my entire life. Kevin Davis was 18 years old when he took the life of his own mother. It seems as though there was some sort of conversation beforehand that had made him upset, which of course is never a good enough reason to do something like this. But there are details about this crime I wish that I could just unlearn. In an interview with police, he gives them an extremely detailed account of basically everything that happened and seems to show absolutely no remorse at all. It is chilling, it is disgusting, and it is honestly just horrific. During his trial, a doctor did testify to say that he had a personality disorder, but that he also fully knew the difference between right and wrong, and knew that his crime was wrong, and that there were no medical diagnosis that could justify his actions. Kevin is still in jail, where he will most likely spend the rest of his life, but he will become eligible for parole in 2044. Finally, in our number one spot today, we have the Axe Man of New Orleans. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, this is not the name of some terrible horror flick, and instead it's the moniker given to a terrible, unidentified serial this person was active in New Orleans, Louisiana, and its surrounding areas from May of 1918 to October 1919. As the name implies, those who were targeted by this person were usually attacked with an axe, and it usually was one that actually belonged to the victims themselves. Many people believe that this person may have been targeting people of Italian descent because this was a theme among the victims, and some also believe that he was mainly targeting women and only took the lives of men when they tried to intervene. This is actually something somewhat supported by the homes where women were killed but men weren't. In the end, although this person is responsible for taking at least 12 lives, exactly who the Axeman is or was remains a mystery. In our number 10 spot today, we have lobotomies. Did you know that it used to be common practice for people to just get a part of their brain cut out? Okay, well maybe not common, but it wasn't as uncommon as you would hope. Lobotomies used to be considered an excellent and efficient cure for things such as mental health problems, which thankfully is a practice that has not survived for a very good reason. Of course, in modern medicine, lobotomies still exist, but only when actually necessary. And there is of course a lot more knowledge about the dangers and effects. One well-known person to have undergone one of these procedures was Rosemary Kennedy, who was John F. Kennedy's sister. She was experiencing seizures as well as mood swings and while these seizures certainly were something that needed to be looked after for her health, I'm not sure if the mood swings necessarily needed some kind of medical intervention. Anyways, to quote unquote cure her, they had a lobotomy performed on her. This procedure left her with the mental capacity of a two year old and she could no longer speak or walk properly. After this, she spent most of her life hidden away and it was thought that her family did this because they were ashamed of her, which is both horrible and so sad. In our number nine spot today, we have the posthumous execution. Okay, so this is something that has actually happened more than once, but I just found out it's happened at all, and I'm both slightly confused and absolutely disgusted at the idea, so I needed to share one example with you guys. So there was a man named Oliver Cromwell, who Wikipedia describes as, quote, an English general and statesman who, first as a subordinate and later as commander in chief, led armies of the Parliament of England against King Charles the first during the English Civil War, subsequently ruling British Isles as Lord Protector from 1653 until his death in 1658. So in 1658, Oliver passed away fairly suddenly and his son Richard became Lord Protector, but because he now had a power base in Parliament or the army, he had to resign just the following year, which effectively ended the Protectorate. Since there was no clear leadership during this time, George Monk was able to have the Long Parliament restored. He then made some slight constitutional 
constitutional adjustments so that Charles II could be invited back from exile in 1660 and actually be a king under a restored monarchy. So then on January 30th, 1661, on what was the 12th anniversary of the execution of King Charles I, Oliver's body was exhumed and executed posthumously. They killed a dead guy. I get that it's like symbolic, but it's just like a little redundant, don't we think? Anyway, his head was cut off and displayed outside of Westminster Hall until 1685. Afterwards, it had a series of different owners, which only adds to the oddity of the story. In our number eight spot today, we have Angel. Agent Orange. Agent Orange is not Cody Banks' cousin, but it was an extremely potent herbicide used from 1961 to 1971 in the Vietnam War. It was intended to cut through the canopy of thick foliage in Vietnam in order to reveal the troops underneath, but instead it proved to be extremely deadly to humans. It caused cancers, birth defects, and so many more different health issues. It's not like it was just a little bit either. 21 million gallons of it were sprayed over Vietnam, which affected hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese citizens, and it also affected the US veterans who faced exposure as well. While this is a dark part of history and it's really difficult to hear about, it's also important that we don't forget things like this. Knowing our history is so important so we don't make the same mistakes again. In our number seven spot today, we we have the Red Summer. The Red Summer is something I didn't even hear mentioned in school, which is honestly absolutely shocking. I'm hoping this is something that is more commonly taught than I think it is, because it really is important. The Red Summer is the term used to refer to the period from the late winter through to the early autumn of 1919, in which white supremacist terrorism and racial riots took place in more than three dozen cities across America. Some of the more well-known race riots that took place during the Red Summer were the Chicago, Washington, D.C. riots. These anti-black riots are said to have developed from a multitude of post-World War I tensions, such as the economic slump and the competition in job and housing markets. In 1919, it certainly wasn't uncommon for there to be race riots and a multitude of white-on-black violence, but the Red Summer really marked some of the first race riots in which black people in number stood up to the white supremacy, resisted, and fought back. During the Red Summer, a civil rights act activist named A. Philip Randolph publicly defended the right of black people to self-defense. It is said that between January 1st and September 14th of 1919, white mobs left at least 43 black Americans, but despite this, the states refused to interfere or prosecute these mobs. Considering how many race riots went on during this summer, we truly could dedicate an entire video to the Red Summer. It is insane to think about how recent 1919 really was, and while we certainly have come a long way, there's always more work to be done and part of the work involves us learning about these horrible histories and what has happened in our past. In our number six spot today we have King Gojian of Yu. King Gojian of Yu had his reign from 496 BC until 465 BC. His reign took place during what was arguably the last major conflict of the spring and autumn period and he was able to lead his state to victory but it certainly wasn't an easy road or without some very creepy happenings. The major conflict he led his state through was the war between Wu and Yu, which started when a Yu princess, who was married to a prince of Wu, left her husband and fled back to Yu. I mean, this of course wasn't the only thing that caused the war, but it certainly sparked the fire. The king was an extremely humble king, as he wouldn't relish in the riches he had, as most royals would. Instead, he ate the same food as peasants and often would leave himself hungry in order to remember that he was in a position to serve his state. Okay, so you might be sitting there wondering when I'm going to get to the scary historical event you came to this video for, so here it is. As I mentioned before, he was able to lead his state to victory, but of course a war involves a lot of sacrifice and some pretty horrific happenings. The king's army was very well known for their ability to scare their enemies before a battle began, and this is because their front line consisted of criminals who had been sentenced to death. In this time, there wasn't lethal injection or the electric chair, so naturally, it was a lot more of a vicious process. These criminals would decapitate themselves in front of the enemy army. Yep, I think this is probably the definition of a scary historical event. I can't even imagine witnessing something like that and then having to proceed with a battle against the army that has people doing that sort of thing. The king was certainly not a leader who wasted any time messing around. In our number five spot today, we have the hostage crisis. In 1980, America saw Ronald Reagan win the presidential election over former president Jimmy Carter, but there was a crisis going on that was taking the attention of Americans everywhere. 
everywhere. The Iran hostage crisis is well known in American history and it began on November 4, 1979 when 52 American diplomats and citizens were held hostage by a group of militarized Iranian college students who took over the US Embassy in Tehran. The 444 days these Americans were held hostage is something I'm sure a lot of Americans learned about at some point or another, but the release of the hostages is what sometimes gets a little murky in the history books. The hostages were released on January 20th, 1981, which was the day that Reagan was inaugurated. There were people who believed that the hostages were released because Reagan was simply just more powerful than Jimmy Carter. Basically what I'm trying to say is that Reagan received a ton of credit for the release of the hostages, but truthfully, it barely had anything to do with him. The Carter administration had been attempting to negotiate with them for months, but they hated Carter because he had provided aid to the former monarch of Iran and had also failed an attempt to rescue the hostages before. So while they certainly were released on inauguration day, it had way less to do with Ronald Reagan and more to do with them just absolutely hating Jimmy Carter. In our number four spot today, we have the zombie virus. I know The Walking Dead is a popular series, but none of us dream of living in that world. I mean, at least I hope not. What a literal nightmare. That is why in 2017, when the UK discovered that many of their caterpillars were falling victim to what became known as zombie virus, we all said we've had enough. Especially now that we've all gone through a pandemic. That kind of energy just needs to stay as far away from us as possible. The caterpillars were being infected with baculovirus, which stops their mold and encourages them to continue eating. Once they've eaten a bunch and they're full to the brim, the virus then tells them to head high onto a leaf, which like, if we weren't talking about a virus that's killing them, that would be like the cutest little sentence, just like high on a little leaf. Anyway, it's not cute and it's sad. Basically, once on their leaf, if a bird doesn't snatch them up, warning, this is kind of gross, their body liquefies and explodes and then the virus is spread onto the other caterpillars below. Yeah, see, let's all move on and forget it ever happened happened. The caterpillars are good, everyone's fine. In our number three spot today, we have the prohibition poisoning. I'm sure most of us learned about the prohibition at some point in school, which of course was the outlaw of the consumption of alcohol, which was done with a ban being placed on the production, importation, transportation, and sale of alcohol by the US government from 1920 to 1933. But it's just as well known that this ban certainly did not stop people from producing or consuming alcohol. It was just done in sneakier ways. The black market for alcohol was booming as people began to drink redistilled industrial alcohol instead. This is all pretty well known, but one super sketchy thing that is definitely less well known is something that government agencies did to curb the black market sales of alcohol. Basically, they poisoned the industrial alcohol that was being repurposed for drinking. And not just poisoned in a way where the drinker would get sick, which is already horrendous enough, but they poisoned the alcohol with lethal chemicals. It is thought that by the time the prohibition ended, at least 10,000 people died from this. This event is still one of the strangest and deadliest decisions made by government officials. In our number two spot today, we have the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. New York City's Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire in 1911 was an unbelievably terrible incident that led to changes being made for factory workers in America. The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory was located on the 8th, 9th, and 10th floors of a building in Greenwich Village, and it of course was where shirtwaists were being made, which we would now call a woman's blouse. I call this place a factory, but it was definitely more like a sweatshop, and the employees were mostly comprised of young women. So like I mentioned before, in 1911, there was unfortunately a fire that broke out on the 8th floor, and because of the cramped and unsafe working conditions, the fire ended up claiming the lives of 146 people that day, which is just horrible. After more details came out about the incident and how terrible the working conditions were, protests broke out all around the city. People began demanding better for the women who had to work in these kinds of places. Like just as an example, the doors to the stairwells and exits were locked so that employees couldn't take unauthorized breaks. How unbelievable is that? And the worst part is that the owners of the company, who were largely responsible for what happened that day, basically basically just got off scot-free. In our number one spot today, we have internment camps. This is something that might be more well known than I think it is, but in my Canadian education, it wasn't something we talked about at all, which is kind of shocking. During World War II, President Franklin Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which would cause 117,000 Japanese Americans to have to give up their homes, jobs, and businesses and move to internment camps. This was due to the fear of espionage after Pearl Harbor. This was truly one of the worst violations of civil rights in the 20th century and 
the government didn't apologize for it until decades later, but they cited national security as the justification for their actions. Unfortunately, this was only the beginning as other countries began to follow suit with Canada, Mexico, Peru, Brazil, Chile, and Argentina all having their own versions of the same kind of atrocity. It is very surprising to me that this isn't something that is discussed more often, as it of course is something that would prove detrimental to the Japanese-American community for decades to come.